Coming up on This Week in Computer Hardware, iPhone 10. How about the Series 3 Apple Watch? NVIDIA Whisper Mode tested, Threadripper coolers on AM4 CPUs, a new Platinum PSU, and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C A G F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 432, recorded September 14th, 2017. A big week for Apple? This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Go to ring.com slash twitch to get up to $150 off a ring of security kits. And buy WordPress. Your customers want to find you, build a wordpress.com website and help them connect with your business. Get 15% off any new plan purchase at wordpress.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch, this week in computer hardware. It's Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you the most useful, most engaging, most delightful, and occasionally most expensive hardware news on the planet. We love mobile. We love desktop. We really love desktop. And today, we're all about the Apple universe, which, amusingly enough, brings me to our co-host for this week, Mr. Alan Malventano, storage maven at large from PCPer.com. How are you doing, sir? What, what does the storage maven have to do with the Apple phone stuff? Well, you're here, and we have a ton of Apple news this week because of the big Apple launch. Practically everything going for sale on September 15th. Are you hitting refresh every minute of your life for the next 12, 15 hours until the purchasing opportunities come up on the Apple website? Are you going to manage? No, the I'm, not, I'm not going to. I'm on, I'm on the East Coast, so it just means I set the alarm clock for like 2.45 in the morning, you know, <laughs> to, which then, is tonight, actually, I think, because the pre-orders yes. for at least the eight, well, what is it? Pre-orders for the 8 and the 8 Plus and I think the watch? Pretty much everything yeah, but the are, 10. Are, yeah, everything but the 10 Next. is tonight at uh, 3 a.m. on this coast and midnight over there. You guys don't have to like pull an all-nighter, fortunately. Stranger things will have happened. Uh, iPhone 10 or X, uh, $999, no price. That's for the 64-gigabyte version. No price yet for the 256-gigabyte version. Um, they are very proud of the Super Retina HD display. And Super Retina is essentially Apple for a 5.8-inch uh, uh, diagonal OLED multi-touch display. It's HDR, 458 pixels per inch. It's a 2436 by 1125 pixel resolution. Um, kind of amusing that they're essentially supporting all the HDR standards. The A11 Bionic chip with 64-bit architecture, a neural engine, we'll talk about what that's for in a second, uh, the embedded M11 motion coprocessor. The cameras are still 12 megapixels, which I'm not particularly surprised at. Uh, F1.8 uh, is the aperture on the wide angle, uh, F2.4 for the telephoto lens on that, um, so uh, a tiny, tiny little upgrade on the telephoto lens for that. Optical zoom, um, portrait mode, portrait lighting uh, in beta. They are very excited about the portrait lighting or the idea that you'd be able to manipulate the lighting for your portraits uh, uh, in post. Um, a six element lens, quad LED, true tone flash with slow sync. Some pretty, uh, the ridiculous video uh, uh, recording opportunities, 4K video recording at 24 frames per second, 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second. Uh, and then some slow-mo video support uh, for 1080p at up to 240 frames per second. Um, really, though, this phone uh, is about two things. Uh, the fit and finish, right? They've eliminated the home button. The screen goes edge to edge except for the little chunk at the top for the sensors and the camera on the screen. And they're really excited about the fit and finish on the enclosure, the glass back. Uh, they finally introduced wireless charging, much to the shock of everyone, I think, listening, uh, using the key wireless or QI, key wireless charging system. Um, something they didn't really discuss in the demo was that both this and the iPhone or the, the show was that both this and the iPhone 8 will be doing uh, fast charging. So a 50% charge and 30 minutes of charging. Um, Again, non-proprietary wireless charging, although they kind of do something a little different with that later on. Um, and face recognition, right? Because you're no longer doing the fingerprints. And people were mixed. People were either really, really excited about this or really, really freaked out about this. 
it's neural networks essentially so that it can take a, a picture of your face. There's an IR camera uh, in the in the uh, in the in the face facing camera on that one. It's going to create this giant collection of points uh, off of your face, and it will use that to unlock your phone. And uh, yeah, basically uh, a you know. 3D picture of your face, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know, lots of lots of freak out about this, like, oh, the police will be able to aim the camera at my face. Oh, how secure will this be? And well, so uh, I had that same question. There's actually a there's right. actually an answer for that. Do you do you know what the answer is? Ken had the Don't answer. I didn't even face. know it was a thing. <laughs> no, so they they it's in uh, it's in iOS 11. You uh, you hit the power. You hit the is it just the power button? I guess standby. Essentially, button. hit the power button, button five times. Yeah, yeah, you hit that button five times, and it just completely like wipes all that stuff out. So, and that also applies even to the older iPhones for if you didn't want them to be able to use your finger, right? Right. If you just hit the which power button five awesome. times, so if you're, which you can kind of do even covertly, if you're just going to put your hand in your pocket to get the phone, you could literally hit that button five times before you even had the phone out of your pocket, right? So, so you know, airport security, you're worried about somebody rifling through your phone or whatever, you could really just revert it almost immediately back to the password required state. Um, yeah, I think I'll probably leave know. it on the password required state. It was, I, and Ken's got a point. Uh, a lot of people, you know, may argue whether or not you that is particularly safe or safe enough. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, well, we're not going to get into the sort of EFF side of things. The thing that kind of blew my mind was how excited they were about the animojis uh, and the animated Snapchat kind of masks and stuff. But you know, they they map thirty thousand points on your face, and then they can take an emoji. And they're very excited about the poop emoji and then animated <laughs> with facial expressions. Um, that was a moment. Um, the cameras on this look to be outstanding. Uh, you know, 12 megapixels more than yeah. enough for, for most uh, typical uses. The video cameras looks really good. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to see uh, what people do with it in the real world. I'm very curious to get hands on it. Um, it looks gorgeous. Um, as you know, any Apple product should, and it's expensive, thousand dollars again for the sixty-four gigabyte version, and nobody knows how expensive the two hundred fifty-six gigabyte version is going to be. Um, the iPhone eight, which you might think of as being the iPhone seven S, um, also with the glass, yeah, yeah you know, uh, and, oh, surgical stainless steel on the on the iPhone ten, uh, iPhone eight, um, four point seven inch display. Uh, Non OLED standard LED 4.7 inch display, the iPhone 8 Plus and 5.5 inch display. The home button remains, you know, the the touch ID remains. Basically, you get the super cool camera, which is almost all of the iPhone 10 camera um, uh, on the iPhone 8 Plus, the dual camera arrangement. You know, can I say one thing before we go on? Because mm -hmm. I want to go back. What? I was really irritated that the iPhone 10 still has a camera bump. You know, couldn't you have made it's it just a little even. thicker and eliminated the camera bump? Yeah, it was, I just yeah, they made I it. Uh, I don't know that it sticks out further, but it's a larger diameter bump because mm -hmm. they have the IS on both cameras now on the on the yeah. iPhone 10. Uh, uh, so you know, I mean, to fit all that stuff in there, they had to they had to make it bigger. Which you know, I mean, you know, if if you're already committed to having the, the right. bump on the back anyway, right? Uh, the uh, iPhone 8, you know, iPhone 8 gets the uh, A11 Bionic chip, the neural engine, the embedded M11 motion code processor. Um, the telephoto is uh, f2.8 instead of f2.4. Uh, but beyond that, um, pretty pretty similar uh, performance capabilities between the two, which may make the iPhone 8 Plus a particular bargain for the photographers out there or people who want the latest in Apple technology in their cell phone camera. Um, you know, you're talking about $799 for the iPhone 8 Plus, $699 for the uh, iPhone 8. Uh, and those are, again, the 64 gigabyte versions. We don't have 256 gigabyte version pricing. Um, good article. Uh, I was reading uh, Vlad Savov over at The Verge. Uh, the iPhone 10 is the one phone where you'll really want to wait for the reviews. And yeah, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I liked what he was getting to in the sense that there's a lot of changes here. The swipe based interface, you know, the the bezel-less screen, um, you know, the wireless charging, Face ID versus Touch ID, um, you know, how strong they're basically saying the glass back is is the strongest. You know, they they say a lot of things. They're the strongest screen in a phone ever, and the glass back is super awesome and amazing. Um, and it's backed with steel and and puppies. And uh, I'm only slightly <laughs> uh, 
uh, <laughs> mocking Apple's presentation. But, um, you know, it, it may be the hardest glass. It may be the most durable glass. But again, it's glass. Uh, and as somebody who, you know, completely trashed their first iPhone 6 in a matter of three days of ownership, um, you know, I was, I, I, I'm a little nervous about that. Uh, the iPhone 10 is certainly outside of my cell phone budget at this point. Um, you know, and it's $999. So it's, it's a not inexpensive investment. Um, you know, mentioned it earlier, iPhone 10 and iPhone 8 are going to charge to 50% in 30 minutes, which I think is an outstanding thing along with the wireless, um, Apple TV gets 4k. It's really yep. expensive. Um, you know, if you're locked into the <laughs> Apple, eco, no, I mean, as somebody who's, who's owned every generation of Apple TV, uh, you know, in no small part, because I have been locked into Apple's ecosystem because I own a ton of, of their content. Um, you know, it's, it's great that they're doing 4k 179 for 32 gigs of storage, $199 for 64 gigabytes of storage. Um, you know, it's, you know, you're basically talking about the equivalent performance of an $89 or $99 Roku box. Um, so there's a huge price premium on this. The flip side is they've done some, what I think are pretty impressive content deals. They've got everybody but Disney on board for $20 4K movies, which is fantastic, yeah. right? Because if you start looking over at Voodoo's uh, 4K UHD movies, you're you know, talking very often, uh, you know, uh, like twenty nine ninety nine for a 4K UHD movie. Um, there's not going to be any Atmos support on the Apple TV 4K as far as we can tell. Their, their audio options aren't particularly sophisticated if you're a bleeding-edge home theater enthusiast. But for the vast majority of people, it's going to have 4K UHD, HDR10, uh, Dolby Vision, um, and what I hope turns out to be a ton of 4K content. And that could be kind of the Trojan horse for Apple, you know, catching back up to Roku in terms of installed units. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen given the number of TVs using the Roku's operating system. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's a really smart thing for uh, Apple. Uh, and, and Apple's, being, again, being aggressive on the 4K uh, uh, movie pricing, like 20 bucks. Uh, and they promise that, you know, all of your eligible HD movies that you own, they will automatically make 4K uh, for free which I thought was a, a really nice thing for them to do. So if you've got a 4K TV uh, and you got a bunch of Apple content, this is looking, uh, it looks like it has a lot of potential. Um, they put a white circle around the home button. Uh, whether or not that circle is raised and i.e. a textural uh, 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 feedback uh, for your thumb in the darkness or whether or not it's just a white circle remains to be seen. Uh, I'm hoping to, to get into a store and uh, as soon as these are available uh, for pre-order, hopefully they'll be in a store so you can play with them. I'm very curious about that because I, I didn't realize how many people were as frustrated as they are with the Apple remote. I found it frustrating for about a week and then uh, it wasn't an issue for me, but some friends of mine were just, you know, all they wanted out of the 4K announcement was a redesigned remote control because that was the most frustrating <laughs> pain point. I mean, you get used to the remote. I mean, it has like, yeah. you know, there's indentations in the buttons at least already. So you just know where the button is after, you know, like you just said, using it for a week or so, mm -hmm. right? Like, you just kind of get used to it. Apparently, uh, you and I got used to it, but a lot of people didn't. Um, yeah. I think the most impressive announcement uh, was not the the iPhone X, uh, but the Apple Watch Series 3. Um I'm really curious about this one, and I was kind of tweeting back and forth with Tom Merritt from, uh, 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 you know, from 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 the the new show. Um, you know, I found the the original Apple Watch to be one of the most frustrating tech purchases I've made in the last decade. Just in terms of the interface was messy, the options were difficult, having to have it linked to the phone. Um, I just found it really really frustrating. And that said, uh, you know, Siri can now talk to you, which is not nearly yep. as cool as the fact that you can now, you know, combine the Series 3 Apple Watch with your iPhone 6 or higher cell phone number, and it will make calls and send texts with just your watch. Uh, you can see it right there on the screen if you're watching the video. That's really exciting to me. Um, you'll be able to get weather without having your watch nearby. Um, I think Apple was much more, as excited as Apple was about the, you know, basically putting a cell modem inside of the, the Apple Watch Series 3. But they were really excited about you having, getting Apple Music and streaming 40 million songs from your wrist. Uh, uh, 
you know, they were which which makes really sense, excited you know, to be able to. That. I mean, you you can do that already. But now you can do that away from your phone, <laughs> right? So that's yeah. the whole, you know. But it's like uh, it's, but, it was the amount of but time it's worth pointing out. Yeah, it's it's worth pointing out though. Uh, to do this away from your phone, you have to add another device. Technically, uh, even though it's you know this SIM that's supposed to be able to basically sort of pseudo clone your number from your phone, it's still using the same number and. and which, by the way, is kind of a unique thing, right? Now you have a separate were, cellular device, which yeah. is using the same number, right? Like that's not like how often have you ever seen that being a thing before? That's not they a were typical a thing little, you can even pull off. They were a little vague on uh, the cost of the data systems, how it's going to be integrated with your phone. Uh, they basically talked about you know the major carriers well, the, are going to support it. They were vague, but we have else. some numbers, and it looks like it's pretty much going to be like ten bucks a month. To add the watch, which I think is high for what it's going to do. Like, it's not as I, I wouldn't imagine the typical user of this device is going to always be away from their phone with it and just use it like instead of the phone. Right. Well, given that, um, you know, given that a lot of the cell phone services are charging like 35 bucks, 25 bucks to add an additional device, um, you know, it doesn't seem too bad. I mean, $429 for the GPS plus cellular version of the 42 millimeter phone at the entry level, 359 for the GPS only. I'm I'm curious. The the heart study they're working on, I think, is very interesting. Uh, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile. Um, you know, it it looks much more functional <laughs> than uh, the original version. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, even Creamy. even all that said, I, I might, I'm actually looking like I have resisted getting an Apple Watch so far and I'm thinking about doing it now. And if I did one now, I would probably either get like a discounted Series 2, uh, right. you know, because the price is going to be like Series those. 3 and Series 1 and, and then they're going to sell out the Series 2. Like the Series 2 is going to get phased out. So, right, right. Well, but I mean, even if I didn't get the Series 2, if I went for the Series 3, because I like, I probably wouldn't even get the cellular version. Like I'd probably just get the, you know, the only real advantage would be, uh, Possibly a little bit better battery life since I wouldn't be ever using it for cellular and I would mm -hmm. kind of assume maybe it has a larger battery in, in that model that didn't have the cell radio. Like the same battery would be in both models, both of the newer models, presumably. Um, and, uh, you know, and obviously it has a faster processor. But like if you look at all the other features, they're actually still mm -hmm. strikingly similar all the way down the line, all the way back to series one. Like, you know, uh, just to because we were curious uh ken hurried up yesterday and updated his uh you know since if you're on the beta track you can get the uh, ios 11 master release is out now and you can also update watches to the you know the to the newest version which i think is watch os 4 mm -hmm. i think for the watch um but even on his watch which i think is a series two like it has all those same features they talked about the keynote all the additional heart right. rate monitoring stuff where it tells you if you're, you know, what's your resting rate typically and all that. All, the, all that software, carry, it, it looks like it carries across the whole line all the way back to the Series 1. So, well, you know, it's really, it's really <laughs> down to just, yeah, it's really down to just like you can get a cell radio and a slightly faster processor in the, the newest version. That's really yeah, what well, it's down to. The newer, well, the newer version, the cellular modem, and then the the W two uh, processor is supposed to have significantly increased bandwidth and uh, lower power consumption for Bluetooth and Wi Fi. Um, yep. The barometer and altimeter. For me, it's 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 it, I'm I'm actually updating the operating system on my Series One watch again because you know it's basically been holding down uh, paper on my desk for most of the last year, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. We will see. <laughs> you will see. Yeah, it's true. You've seen it there. I've seen oh, that watch. I was like, hey, what are you doing with that watch, Patrick? And like, we had to like Sad, wake it from, we had to wake watch. it from being dead before it would do anything because it just been sitting on your desk and like completely died. Oh my goodness. Everything can be pre-ordered on the 15th, shipping on the 22nd, except for the iPhone 10, uh, which is the pre-orders that are going to start uh, on October 27th. Just so you know, um, I again, I'm, I, I get for me the most exciting thing on on the list was really that Series Three Apple Watch, which I did not expect. Yeah. This episode of this week in computer hardware.
brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. Ring's mission is to make neighborhoods safer, and today over a million people use the amazing Ring Video Doorbell to help protect their homes. Ring knows home security begins at the front door, but it doesn't end there because you got a whole house, right? That's why they're extending that same level of security to the rest of your home with the Ring Floodlight Cam. Just like Ring's video doorbell, Floodlight Cam is a motion-activated camera and floodlight that connects to your phone. HD video, two-way audio, lets you know the moment anyone steps on your property. You can see and speak to visitors, even set off an alarm right from your phone. Get off my lawn, kid. With Ring's Floodlight Cam, when things go bump in the night, you'll immediately know what it is. When you're home or away, the Ring Floodlight Cam lets you keep an eye on your home. Ring Floodlight Cams offer the ultimate in home security with high-visibility floodlights and a powerful HD camera that puts security in your hands. It's a nice feeling. Name the Wall Street Journal's best of CES 2017. You can monitor every corner of your property with a ring of security kit. All the kits include a ring video doorbell and your choice of either one, two, or three floodlight cams. Connect your ring video doorbell with your favorite smart locks and hubs for added convenience, monitoring, and security. Just have it all sorted out. It's nice. With Ring, you're always home. Save up to $150 off a Ring of Security kit when you go to ring.com slash twitch. That's ring.com slash T-W-I-C-H, and we thank Ring for their support. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure there is a Ring video doorbell on the door of the office you're in right now, Ryan. Excuse me, Alex. There's, there's, <laughs> there's, uh, technically, there's two. Really? Yeah, we got two doors. Ooh. You know, monitor so one on all the, side. the doors. Yeah, monitor time. all the doors. And if you had any outside <laughs> on the property, you could put the well, floodlight yeah. cams on. That's true. Just talk to Ryan about that. Tell me you, you don't feel secure and you want to feel more secure. I have been thinking about getting one of those from my backyard at my house. It'd be fun to put one to watch the chickens in our backyard so that if we heard the <laughs> chicken disturbance in the night, we could fire up the siren and scare the raccoons away. <laughs> All right. Oh, my goodness. AMD Radeon Technologies Group, Roger Kaduri, goes on sabbatical. Uh, did Ryan talk about this on the podcast last night? He did. Um, and, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> he, he went on a sabbatical. Yeah. Um, th th there's, there's kind of like some more disappointment in what the – community has responded with in this than than in the story itself in my opinion at least like you know because you have guys out there going oh he sh you know yeah he should have stepped down or just people like venting whatever their frustration was with recent you know amd gpu releases uh and trying to pin it all on one guy as if like you know one person is in charge of every single moving part of of a thing ever but i digress um yeah, went on sabbatical. Uh, kind of working theory we have is that, uh, you know, he's taking a break. He was uh, probably uh, cashing out too many, like, brown family brownie points from all the, you know, work <laughs> he was doing on, right? Like, I would imagine there are plenty no, of nights I, where that guy was, yeah, he's probably uh, probably burning the midnight really. oil a lot, right? Um, in order to get uh, in order to get Vega out the door, and now it's out. Uh, so, we well, you know, let the guy take a break. Um and uh, He'll be back in December. I would think he might. I would think he might try to come back in in more of like a, like what he used to do, instead of mm -hmm. being at, at such a high level. Because you know you get burdened down, uh, burdened down with a bunch of other stuff when you're at that level, and you you were somebody that was like really technical and that sort of thing. It's it makes it tough to be able to do the thing that like you might have been the best at. So, um, you know, we'll see. We gotta see uh, what pans out with that. Good to know. Yep. Lisa Ryan Sue stepped in to take his place for the moment, just so we have said all that needs to be said there. That, uh, that should leave the group in, in good hands. Yeah. Ryan Trout wrote that one up on PCPer.com. Uh, Jeremy uh, has a notification for everyone. Free Champions Pack for Quake Champions for free with AMD GPUs and CPUs. Ruby, the animated heroine ATI used in tech demos for years, has returned and is now playable in Quake Champions for those who claim their free key. So uh, Ryzen 5 or 7 APU or an RX 560, 570, 580, you can claim the Champions Pack for Quake Champions for free. Uh, that would normally be a $40 
uh, retail. And uh, if you purchase one of the products after August 22nd, you can get your key over at AMD Rewards. That's going to run until October 29th or, quote, until the keys run out. So if you're eligible, don't wait to score your free shiny. Um, another one from Jeremy was uh, looking at the Threadripple cooler on an AM4 socket. Um, that was interesting, right? Hard OCP went kind of nuts on this one. They they uh, <laughs> they put the X XSPC Raystorm Threadripper water block on a Ryzen 7 1700X overclocked to four gigahertz, and apparently it mated perfectly with the AM4 processor. Quote, yeah, the performance, the, yeah, on the other hand, demonstrates the advantage of using coolers specifically designed for your processor. Because if the if the processor, if the physical CPU is located in a different place underneath the lid, the cooling may not be concentrated in the place it needs uh, for the best performance. But uh, that's also yeah. true. Hard yeah, because, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, because the you know the water block for Threadripper is going to have its finned areas. Like you can actually kind of tell in the picture, and like one of the first pictures in that article, if you kind of like zoom in on that guy, you can tell that there's finned areas in four you know four corners of the card or of the of the cooler, right? So it's mm -hmm. concentrating its cooling on the four corners where you would have the four Threadripper. Well, two of the four Threadripper dies, right? Um, if it was an Epic processor you had in there, it'd be all four of the yeah, active right. dies. But uh, yeah, so I mean, if you stick that on a CPU that has its cores more towards the center, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Now you have to conduct heat across, like diagonally across the copper to get to the areas that are actually being cooled by the liquid. So, you know, and, and that gave you, uh, I think it was like a three degree Celsius difference almost, two or three degrees Celsius. So yeah, use the, use the right tool for the job. Oops. Please. <laughs> we beseech you. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Uh, Ken got uh, hands-on with NVIDIA's Whisper Mode. Quieter gaming for, for notebooks. That's the promise. What was the actual result of Whisper Mode? Uh, so it depended on, like, which, uh, which notebook. We tested a couple of notebooks with this. Uh, and the idea here is just it's, it's like a profile through GeForce Experience, and it's able to go in and tweak settings in the game, you know, game-specific settings, right? Um, mm -hmm. With the end goal being, oh, let's reduce the power draw um, and also let's try to keep the frame rates limited to a specific value, right? Um, first order of business, there was a little bit of confusion on, in that thing if you wanted to be able to, you know, dial and mess with the dials yourself. GeForce Experience adjusts the game settings, uh, but it does it in a very like black box kind of manner, right? You point it at a game and say, do this, and it just like, it tweaks some things, right? But if you wanted to change the actual frame rate that was that the game was being limited to you had to go into your geforce driver settings find the game in the list go and tweak the tweak the stuff there um so still a little bit kind of cumbersome right having to uh, toggle back and forth between a couple of different pieces of software um but that aside uh so tested two platforms one of them was a 10 a gtx 1070 max q laptop and another one uh had a 1080. now we're not sure if it was down to just like fan curves or how the, the two different systems had operated in their each even each having a unique kind of thermal envelope there. Like maybe one could dissipate heat a little bit better than the other one or more efficiently or less efficiently or whatnot, right? Um, mm -hmm. End result was we didn't see huge gains on the 1070 Max-Q design laptop. But if you went to the 1080 Max-Q design laptop... There's pretty large differences to be seen there. So if you're looking at decibels, which is what's on those charts there, uh, you know, Hitman as an example went from 48 and a half decibels down to 36 decibels. And realize every time you drop by six decibels, that's half of the sound level. So, you know, you're talking like fraction of of the of the noise coming out of that game just by changing this mode, basically by just flipping a switch in GeForce Experience and just rerunning the game and you know, realize there is some of a performance hit, right? Because you're trying to run at a right. lower lower frame rate. But uh, we're not really sure. Like, this isn't the kind of thing you'd expect everybody to want to jump on and do, but it's a handy feature to have if you have a laptop and you want to do gaming and you're in some sort of a quiet environment, right? Like, you want to fire up a game in a library at a school for some reason. Like, you just want to sit in the back corner and game with headphones on. Um, you, <laughs> wouldn't want your, you wouldn't want your laptop in the back corner sounding like a hairdryer while you're trying to do it. Right. 
Um, so this can quiet it down. If you're living with some folks like, you know, roommates or whatnot, and they're trying to sleep and you're in the same room or whatever, and you don't want to make a bunch of noise, you know, there's there's times for that where you'd want, you know, where you'd want to be gaming in a quieter environment, right? Um, right. Yeah, and there you can see um, Whisper Mode off and on, like, differences in, in this case, like, uh, what was that showing, actually, on that particular chart? Was that just power draw? Possibly. Sure. Um, yeah, Metro Last Light on the ROG Zephyrus. Yeah, so basically, you're just looking at your power draw there, and the power draw got cut in half. Right on that on that particular platform, just by going into whisper mode. Again, you get a performance hit, right? right. And your frame rate is gonna is gonna go down, but you know, end result is a, a much reduced heat output from the system and a very consistent frame time, which is an important thing to note, right? The the frame time, which we measured by actually like mm -hmm. monitoring, uh, you know, outputting frames directly to a separate capture system and seeing exactly what was the frame time. Um, it was probably the most consistent frame time we had ever seen. Like it was literally just like a flat, solid line right across. So, um, and that means that even though you're at a lower frame rate, your experience should still be pretty good, right? You're not going to have your your frame rates being inconsistent and kind of jumping around and getting kind of juddery performance there. Um, so yeah, like there you have it. Um, yeah, yeah. So just, you know, a feature you can use on mobile systems and, uh, you know, especially with benefits to the the max Q design systems, which are designed to kind of be running right at the limit of like, what's the perfect match for your thermal thermals versus your performance in the first place. So you can make those systems even quieter. So <laughs> cool stuff. Make everything more awesome and less loud. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good thing. This episode of this week in computer hardware brought to you by WordPress. Every day, millions of people go online to search for local businesses. Does your small business show up? When you create a website on WordPress.com, you make it easier for your customers to find you, connect with you, and hear how you can help them. Your business needs an online home. It needs a WordPress.com website. You don't need prior experience. You don't need to hire someone to do it for you. WordPress.com guides you through the entire process. You choose from hundreds of beautiful designs. You boost your visibility with built-in search engine optimization and social sharing. You can activate other WordPress plugins for the functionality your business needs. With a WordPress.com plan, expert support is there to help you focus on what matters, growing your business. 28% of all websites run on WordPress. 28% create your WordPress.com site, and you'll see why. Get started today with 15% off any new plan purchase. Go to WordPress.com slash Twitch to create your website and find the plan that's right for you. That's WordPress.com slash T-W-I-C-H for 15% off your brand new website. And we thank WordPress for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Goodness. Some new Nooks from Intel, Dawson Canyon Nooks with 15-watt Cobby Lake CPUs. Um, basically, last year, the Baby Canyon Nook uh, kits came out, and now Intel's launching the Dawson Canyon Nooks powered by 15-watt Cobby Lake processors. Um, <laughs> I like Tim Berry's line, quote, despite Dawson Canyon sounding more dramatic than Baby Canyon, the new Nooks are lower-powered and ditch Iris graphics and USB 3.1 Type-C, which is probably not a big loss for the mass majority of Nook users. Um, six new models, three flavors, bare bones, a slim case kit, and a taller kit that's got room for a two-and-a-half-inch drive. They're going to have either a Core i3 or Core i5 processor, uh, Dawson Canyon supports Intel rapid storage technology and Optane memory, so you can play around with some performance boost opportunities there. Core i3-7100U 2.4 gigahertz and Core i5-7300U uh, 3.4 gigahertz boosted processors. Um, dual cores, hyper-threading, 3 megabytes of cache, Intel HD Graphics 620, and again, 15-watt TDPs. These are not high-performance machines, but these are quiet, cool, uh, you know, two core, four thread boxes uh, that probably not be as expensive as some of the nooks we've seen. Four USB 3.0 ports, a gigabit ethernet port, and two HDMI outputs, uh, one with protected UHD. They're gonna be shipping uh, the tail end of 2017. Pricing is not currently available. So right. I assume they will be uh, somewhat less emotionally traumatic than some of the other nooks we've seen, but I could be horrendously <laughs> wrong about that one. 
Uh, man, uh, Lee Garbutt uh, got hands-on with a Seasonic Focus plus Platinum 550-watt power supply units. Is it awesome? Uh, well, I mean, the key here is just that they're getting a Platinum rating in a relatively low wattage power supply, right? Mm -hmm. Um and Which you know, is good. also relatively compact, right? But so, yeah, some people that want uh, to run a lower power system, like a lower wattage requirement system, would also still want to be really efficient. Usually, those are kind of contradictory, right? Usually, you get more efficient at the, uh, you know, generally speaking, and like it's easier to do with like putting some, like some of the higher power output units tend to to go into the platinum range, uh, because. That's where you'd really care more about being more efficient because you're putting less heat out from the power supply. But now they're kind of, you know, the platinum rating is kind of moving down into the lower end of the spectrum there as far as uh, your power output. So 100 bucks for a 550 watt platinum rated power supply. And of it's course, funny. Lee did all of his, you know, uh, all of his detailed uh, tests that he does on a power supply. So the, the rating, uh, what was the max rating he got? So at... 275 watt draw, which is actually a pretty, you know, reasonable spot for a typical uh, typical system that's not kind of like a power user system. Uh, 92 and a half percent efficiency. Uh, that's pretty good, uh, and that's on and that's on 120 volt source. So if you're overseas right. and you get one of these and you use it on a 240 volt uh, supply, it, the efficiency actually goes even higher. I think. Nothing wrong with that. It's, uh, it's you know, some people might say it's a little expensive, but again, it's it's 80 plus platinum. Uh, build quality should be outstanding. Um, you know, 80 plus platinum rated uh, and then 550 watts continuous DC output at up to 50 degrees Celsius, which is 122 ish degrees. Should you be thinking in Fahrenheit instead of Celsius? Um, Ten year warranty. Again, we are seeing a bunch of power supplies that are being over-engineered and given particularly amazing uh, warranties. So yep. I am all with having a power supply that creates no issues for me. So if you're looking for something, and, and it's funny, like the, I was going to say like 550 watts for 99.99 or 99.90 uh, USD uh, on Newegg, topping out at 850 watts for 140 bucks. So. Yeah. yeah. Lots I mean, don't get me wrong. You can you can you can find uh cheaper 550 watt power supplies out there, but you know, not as well efficiency rated and with not as long of a warranty. So 10 years. So, you know, you get what you pay for. <laughs> Hopefully, you get what you pay well, for. Usually. Yeah. One last thought before we go. Another article about Tim Vary. Uh, Philips. I love the ultra wide monitors. Uh, monitors. Uh, uh, Dell U thirty four fifteen W is my standard desktop model. Um, Philips revealed this beast: a forty nine inch ultra wide monitor. It's going to come out uh, late in twenty eighteen, second half of twenty eighteen. The Philips four ninety two P eight with a thirty two to nine aspect ratio. Um, Essentially uh, built on the same panel as Samsung's CH90 QLED. Uh, looking at an MSRP of uh, $1,077. Um, and that's a significant price reduction over that Samsung CH90 because they've eliminated FreeSync 2. They eliminated Samsung's QLED backlighting. Um, we don't know what the refresh rate is going to be. We don't know if it's going to support high dynamic range. Uh, but you're talking about a 49 inch 3840 by 1080 uh, monitor with an 1800R curvature. I would be very curious to see what that looks like because that's that's a, a very tight curvature to me, but it's also a very very wide monitor, and the pixels are going to be fairly expansive. Uh, 3840 by 1080 on a 49 inch monitor. Not that you're going to be noticing them for playing games, but I think it's going to be. Uh, a very interesting one to take a look at. 600 uh, candelas per meter squared for the maximum brightness. Uh, display port, HDMI, VGA, USB Type-C display inputs. Um, you know, two-port USB 3.0 hub. Uh, it's an interesting monitor, right? 32 by 9, uh, big, 49 inches. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, one of the, the notes at the bottom of it is, uh, you know, would you put a 49-inch, 34-pound monitor on your desk <laughs> and why did they at least go to 1,200 pixels on the vertical resolution? I was kind of surprised that they did 1080p by 3840 on a monitor this big. But you know that may have been what the glass was available and affordable yeah. for that installation. And the, and the one thing that's a question mark is we don't know what the refresh rate is. We think it might be 144. Yeah. 
Um, if it is, then yeah, okay, kind of. Um, you know, we're kind of like wondering like who who really wants this panel, right? Because it's the right. vertical resolution is only 1080. Um, it could be gamers that are used to doing dual panel gaming and they just don't want the bezel down the center. You know, like that sort of thing. That could be that could be a use case. Also, it's worth noting if you can do 144 hertz refresh, if you're playing like VSync Golf anyway, 144, um, it, it gets pretty hard to see tears once you're yeah. that fast, right? Um, so, you know, the really higher refresh rate displays, it almost gets to the point where FreeSync and G-Sync don't give you nearly as much of a of a benefit as they do, uh, you know, with with lower refresh rate panels. There's still a benefit, but just it's it's becomes less noticeable. And that's just coming from someone who's usually picky about that sort of thing and has, is usually sitting in front of these panels, like testing them out with uh, G-Sync mm -hmm. and FreeSync, this enabled and disabled a lot just for right. kind of panel testing that we do in house. Right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, interesting. Um, you know, we might, might take a look at it at some point. We'll have to see. I would not be surprised. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to wrap this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware. Are there any exciting advances in storage that are coming up uh, maybe for review on PC Per, sir? Uh, there's none that I can talk about. I'd love to talk about <laughs> them, but I can't, can't talk about them yet. But you'd never get the whatever they are again from the companies again. That's true. Oh, my goodness. Really want to talk about them? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. We... Uh, we got not too in-depth. We talked a bunch about uh, what to do if you are one of the 143 million Americans potentially affected uh, by the break-in at Equifax this week. Shannon got hands-on with Razer's Basilisk mouse. Literally so new, it was shipped to her direct from the warehouse in China. And, of course, we talked a whole bunch about what's going on with iPhone 10, Apple TV, and uh, one of my favorite uh, spiels I've written in a long time, getting XFAT drives, universal drives, getting uh, universal XFAT formatted drives to work on Linux. We walk you through everything you need to know uh, to get those running on your Linux machine in uh, this episode of Tech Thing up at techthing.com. I, I uh, wasn't aware our, that I wasn't aware that XFAT was a tricky thing in this day and age on Linux. Well, you know, it depends it just on whether or not Fuse has been installed on your system. <laughs> Pseudo oh. apt get. Maybe There's always the a trick. There's always a there's trick. always some trick. Well, I mean, essentially, Microsoft owns XFAT, and there's some pretty restrictive licensing on that. So Microsoft, they you know they got it in Windows. Apple's got it yeah. in OS 10. Linux, yeah. not so much. So in terms of the primary distributions, but something there to, to look at. Uh, Robert Heron and I on AVXL this week go a little bit nuts because we were at Cedia on Friday. So we saw all the new 4K projectors. We saw some really nice screens. Uh, we saw a whole bunch of new speakers from Kef and Elac and uh, Definitive. And uh, that's uh, that episode should be up tomorrow. That was a that was a fun day. A long day because we we both took the same like 5:50 a.m. flight out of Oakland uh, down to San Diego, but man, there were some gorgeous screens down there, uh, including what I think is one of the most practical HDTVs I've seen in a long time, which is from Samsung. They call it the Frame, which is essentially an HDTV with a swappable wooden frame around it, so it looks like art. And they did a whole bunch of really interesting things to make art look more realistic on this screen. But the best part about it is it's not three millimeters thick. It doesn't cost $10 billion. Uh, and you can change it with your decor if you're the kind of person that wants decor changing opportunities. But uh, we talk about a lot more than that on uh, this week's AVXL. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on This Week in Computer Hardware. I suspect there will be a whole bunch more hardware news next week that we can't talk about just yet. So if you're not subscribed already, do us a favor. Go to twit.tv slash TWICH. That, twit, that is twit.tv slash Twitch. You get all of our older episodes. You get information on how to subscribe. You get links to Ryan and I. And uh, we want to thank you for joining us on the adventure that is Twitch. And I want to thank you for joining us today, Mr. Malventano in Ryan's place. Thank you, sir. See you guys, uh, you know. I would say on the next one, but that'll be Ryan. <laughs> well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Alan Malventano. And uh, I, at least, will see you next week on Twitch. Twitch.